I titled my talk Personalized Personalized Medicine because I'm a physician scientist trying to practice personalized medicine, and I'm also a patient battling the same disease that I'm studying. The picture on the left of the screen is of me as a healthy third-year medical student training to become an oncologist in memory of my mom who had passed away from cancer just a few years before. The picture on the right side of the screen is of me just a few weeks later when I was dying in the intensive care unit in the exact same hospital that I'd treated patients just weeks before. I was experiencing multiple organ system failure. My liver, my kidneys, my bone marrow, my heart, and my lungs were shutting down for an unknown cause. I gained 70 pounds of fluid. I had a retinal hemorrhage that made me blind in my left eye, and I had to say goodbye to my family and friends. Around that time, after 11 weeks in the intensive care unit, my doctors encouraged my family to say their final goodbyes, and my family brought in a priest to administer my last rites to me. I've considered that moment when I had my last rites read to me to be the start of my overtime, a time that I didn't think I would have, but a time where every single second counts. Shortly thereafter, a lymph node biopsy was performed, and I got the diagnosis of idiopathic multicentric calcium disease. This is actually a picture of my lymph node, and the pathologist commented on just how many blood vessels were in my lymph node. But with this lymph node biopsy and with my clinical picture, I was diagnosed with this rare disease, idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, a disease where the immune system becomes hyperactivated and then attacks and shuts down the body's vital organs for an unknown cause. There are about 5,000 patients diagnosed each year in the United States with one form of Castleman disease. And for my particular form of Castleman disease, a third of us will die within five years of diagnosis, and another third will die within 10 years of diagnosis. With the diagnosis, I was immediately given chemotherapy, and my life was saved, thankfully. Unfortunately, a few weeks later, I was back in the hospital, back in intensive care with multi-organ failure, relapsing even on chemotherapy. This time, I received multi-agent, seven different chemotherapy drugs, VDT PACE chemotherapy, seven of the most intense chemotherapies that exist that completely obliterated my immune system. But to give you a perspective for how sick I was, I actually felt better with every single dose of chemotherapy than I did before because we were finally treating my disease. This is a picture of my dad and I at, when I was starting to feel better. At this stage, I'd been hospitalized for almost five months in total, but I'm sitting up and I've just gotten chemo and I'm so thankful to be alive. You can see that I'm, I'm not 100%. I've, I've you know, lost my hair. My, my belly's so large. My dad's actually resting his hand on my belly because of the liver and kidney failure. At the time, I was receiving dialysis and also getting daily blood transfusions to, to keep me alive. But I was so thankful to, to finally be able to sit up. A couple days later, it was New Year's Eve of 2010, and my dad and I decided to go for a walk around the hematology oncology floor. And it was about 8 p.m. that night, and as we passed the family waiting area, we noticed there was a gentleman who looked like he'd been drinking on New Year's Eve. He was kind of swaying in his chair. And so on our next lap around the hematology oncology floor, we noticed this gentleman had fallen onto the floor. So my dad ran over to him and helped him back into his chair. And he looked at us, he said, thanks so much, good luck to you and your wife. We said, wife, what's he talking about? Then I looked at my belly and I realized he thought I was my dad's pregnant wife, <laughs> which was a low point emotionally for, for both of us. Uh, but, I, but, but I turned to my dad and I said, man, you've got an ugly wife. <laughs> and we laughed so, so hard because we were just so thankful that I even could laugh. After a total of uh, another seven weeks hospitalized, I was finally discharged. And this is a picture of me um, a few days after getting out of the hospital and you can see maybe how someone could have confused me as my, my dad's pregnant wife uh, with my big belly. And then this is a picture from just a few years before when I, I played college football uh, at Georgetown. And, and I always say, this is like the worst before and after picture ever. <laughs> but if we could flip the order, I feel like it could be an advertisement for Peloton or Muscle Milk. Um, but I did not use Peloton or Muscle Milk. Uh, it was purely just finally getting uh, this disease into remission. So uh, over the next eight weeks, I took a picture every week and you can see uh, my hair uh, starting to grow back. You can see my, my belly starting to shrink away. And by the end of eight weeks, I, I look a little bit less like my, my dad's pregnant wife.
So uh, I spent another few months recovering um, and then finally returning back to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. I was started on an experimental drug called siltuximab, the first drug to ever undergo a randomized controlled trial for Castleman disease, and I was hopeful that this drug would keep me in remission, that I could go back to my plan of becoming an oncologist and treating patients in, in memory of my mom. And when I got to Penn, um, I, I did do a little bit of Castleman's research. I ended up writing a case report about myself. And so, so I was the, the patient. And I was also the author. And then they put a picture of my chest on the cover of their journal. And, and the reason I wrote this case report was because I noticed when I was ill that I had these eruptions of blood moles all over my chest and shoulders, basically balls of blood vessels. And, and every time I would bring it up to the doctors, I'd say, you know, what about these blood moles? They'd say, your liver, your kidneys, and your bone marrow are failing. Forget about the blood moles. But what I've learned subsequently is that with every one of my relapses, my blood moles begin to grow, and they're some of my earliest signs that I'm actually about to have a relapse, and they would come in um, quite handy uh, later on. So I returned to Penn. Uh, I started, uh, I, I did the, the case report that I described, and I also got involved in Penn's Orphan Disease Center. Uh, Penn had just received a major gift to start this rare disease center, and I was able to be a part of the early strategic planning uh, for the Orphan Disease Center. But unfortunately, in the midst of, of being back at Penn and getting back on track, I had another relapse. This time, I had now relapsed on the only drug in development for my disease. I had now failed the only hope that I had left. And I had a conversation with my doctor. I said, OK, doctor, what other drugs are coming down the pipeline? And he said, there aren't any. And I said, OK, well, what other promising cell types or signaling pathways, what sort of targets are out there that, that we can maybe go after? And he said, there aren't any. And I said, well, are, are, are there researchers out there who are doing promising work that I can be hopeful that maybe there will be a drug for me? And he said, no, there aren't any. And just in that conversation, I went from being this optimistic medical student, hoping and praying for a treatment for myself and for other patients, to realizing that actually there was no one else out there that could help me. And that if I wanted to survive, if I wanted to have a future, I would need to turn my hope for a future into action. And so when my doctor left the room, I turned to my, my dad, my sisters, and my girlfriend, and I told them, I said, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life, however long that may be, to trying to identify a treatment or a cure for this disease. So when I recovered, thanks to the multi-agent chemotherapy, I, I came back to the University of Pennsylvania, and I began conducting laboratory research on the, the samples I could get the easiest access to my own. And I also started a foundation called the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network to try to accelerate research and treatment development on an international scale. Let me tell you a little about how the Castleman disease field was back in 2012. So there were about $10,000 a year being spent on translational research into idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease. Zero NIH funding had ever gone towards studying IMCD. There was no research infrastructure in place. Zero large clinical pathological studies to describe the disease had been done. As a result, there was no diagnostic criteria because no one had ever systematically characterized the disease. There were no cell lines, animal models, registries, or biobanks that existed. There were no predictive biomarkers of whether someone was likely to respond or not respond to given drugs. There were no treatment guidelines. The disease was very poorly understood. There were no FDA-approved therapies. And there were no drugs in development beyond this one drug targeting interleukin-6. It was frightening to understand this. But I was thankful that there was this drug being developed the targeted interleukin-6, though the drug did not work for me, it does help about one-third of Castleman disease patients. And it's thanks to, to this gentleman, Kazu Yoshizaki, photographed here, who identified interleukin-6 as an important driver in Castleman disease. And actually, I heard from a colleague that Kazu had tested a drug that targets interleukin-6 receptor on himself. And I said, Kazu, I heard you tried tocilizumab on yourself as the first human to prove that it was safe. He said, no, 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 I didn't try it on, on myself. The nurse, she gave it to me. <laughs> I said, exactly, Kazu. So Kazu tried that drug. It ended up going on to get FDA approval in the United States for rheumatoid arthritis, but was initially developed for Castleman disease. So kind of understanding where we were as a field, not in a good place, I wanted to look to see how is rare disease research pushed forward for other diseases. And so I looked at, at how research is done and what I call the kind of traditional approach. So typically in rare diseases, patients and loved ones raise money
money, and then foundations announce requests for proposals and invite researchers to apply to use the funding how they would see fit. Um, then a few uh, expert researchers will select the best applicants uh, from those who apply, uh, or sorry, a few, few researchers will apply, and then a panel will select the best applicants, um, and then the research gets performed. And so basically, you know, you hope that the right researcher applies for the right project at the right time, and then you hope that that research is then translated. We decided to come up with a different approach, what we call the collaborative network approach. Where we, we wanted to start by first expanding the community of physicians and researchers, and also including patients as part of that community, using the entire community to identify and prioritize what research should be done. Not, research, not what research do you want to do in your lab, but what research needs to be done, and then going out and looking at other fields to figure out who is the right person to do our study right now, um, raising the funding to make the studies happen, sharing the data back to our our community so that way the community can continue to crowdsource the right research ideas, utilizing those same data to see what drugs are already FDA approved for one thing that might actually be able to be repurposed for this other disease, and then when drugs are used off-label, making sure to assess their effectiveness in the real-world setting and also through clinical trials with the ultimate goal of getting towards personalized medicine, the right drug for the right patient at the right time. This is this new approach what we call the collaborative network approach, which we spearheaded first for Castleman disease. And as a result, we've been able to establish a really large research pipeline. So I'm not going to go through these studies individually, but before we started in 2012, I mentioned there was about $10,000 spent per year in translational research. None of these studies were in process, but today, in 2019, we have approximately 18 studies that are, that are various stages. Um, we've been able to make a lot of progress thanks to this really systematic and proactive approach to science. But back in 2014, or sorry, back in 2013, um, Right around the time that I graduated from medical school, this is a photo of my wife and I at my medical school graduation from Penn, um, I decided I wanted to enroll in business school at Warden because I recognized that some of the biggest challenges in the way of progress for Castleman disease were actually syst systemic and managerial problems. So I enrolled in business school, and shortly thereafter, I had my fifth deadly relapse. So for the fifth time, I nearly died, and for the fifth time, I needed multi-agent chemotherapy to save my life. We don't have any pictures from that hospital because it was such a scary time and we just didn't even know if I would make it. Um, but you can see this photo from a few weeks later at my wife and I's engagement party. In between, I had nearly died in between these photos. And there I was, having failed to respond to any drug that had ever been tried for my disease, and even weekly chemotherapy could not prevent a relapse. I knew that if I wanted to make it to May 24th, 2014, which was our wedding date, that I would need to identify a treatment that could keep me alive. And so let me frame the problem that I was facing at this stage. So in Castleman disease, we know that the immune system becomes hyperactivated. Uh, we don't know why it becomes hyperactivated. We don't know which immune cell types are really the problems in idiopathic MCD. We don't know what key signaling pathways are causing problems in Castleman's, and we don't know the cytokines that are driving the cytokine storm. So there's hundreds of different cell types, hundreds of different signaling pathways, and hundreds of different cytokines that could all be the problem in Castleman disease, none of which we actually knew. And my task was to identify one of those things that maybe we could target with a drug so that I could make it to May 24th, 2014. And so fortunately, I had been running cytokine panels on my blood every month leading up to my, my last relapse. And in those cytokine panels, we were able to find a couple trends. So there was a, a protein called VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, that's critical for blood vessel development. That was very elevated early on leading up to my relapse. And another protein produced by activated T cells was also an early riser leading up to my relapse. I also measured 1,300 different proteins in my blood uh, doing serum proteomics and was able to confirm that, in fact, those two proteins from our cytokine panels were also two of the most elevated proteins when we expanded our panel. I also had blood samples for myself. I ran flow cytometry to confirm that, in fact, there were activated T cells in my blood during, during my uh, relapses. And my clinical data was consistent with what we were seeing in the lab. So, so my data was, was corroborative with those blood moles that I told you about, with the increased blood vessels um, in my lymph nodes. So this kind of fit together that maybe VEGF and T cell activation, that these were critical to my disease. So we wondered, is there something common to both T cell activation and also VEGF expression that maybe we could target with a drug that could save my life? 
So we turned back to the proteomics data and we did pathway analyses on the data, asking the question, is there a drug target potentially within the data um, that we could go after involved in both T cell activation and VEGF? And using multiple different pathway analysis tools, they all triangulated on this PI3 kinase AKT mTOR signaling pathway as being a candidate that could be involved in what was happening um, in my samples. Fortunately, there is a very straightforward experiment you can do to ask, is mTOR active in your tissue? Um, and so I felt that at this stage, we needed to do target validation. And so we went to lymph node tissue, and this is a lymph node of a normal person, to ask the question, is mTOR active in my cells? And so in this normal lymph node, uh, brown is positive for mTOR activation, and blue would be background negative staining. And you can see in a normal lymph node, there's some mTOR activation, low level, but certainly some. And then if you look at my lymph node, you can see just striking mTOR activation. So with this data, we now are armed to say that mTOR is active and that maybe targeting the mTOR signaling pathway with an existing drug could maybe keep me alive and make it, to, and I could make it to my wedding date. Fortunately, there's a drug called Serolimus that was developed 25 years ago. It's a potent mTOR inhibitor um, that we decided to try on me as the first patient ever with Castleman disease to be given Serolimus. Now, in my first three and a half years after diagnosis, I nearly died five times with multi-organ failure due to my disease. But since starting Serolimus, it's now been 69.94 months since my last relapse. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been 69.94 months since my last relapse. But I know that I can't round up. I don't know if I'm going to relapse tomorrow, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to 70 months, but I also refused to round down because my colleagues and I worked really hard for that 0.94 months and we're continuing to work hard for other patients just like me. The New York Times described this as doctor cure thyself a couple years ago, which I think is a bit of an overstatement. I think it should probably say doctor helping himself a little bit right now and hopefully for a lot longer, um, but I don't think that that would fit on the, on the headline. But importantly, during this time, I made it to May 24th, 2014. I got married to, to my wife, Caitlin. And 14 months ago, uh, we had our beautiful daughter, Amelia. Thank you. Uh, Amelia brings us so much joy. I, I started out chasing my cure so that I could live. Now I'm chasing my cure so I can watch my daughter live and grow up. We've now also started to give this drug to other Castleman disease patients. This is a picture of Joey, a picture of Joey who uh, was very ill with Castleman disease and unfortunately did not respond to first line or second line therapy and had a really, really positive response uh, to serolimus treatment. And also another patient, Katie, who also wasn't responding to first, second, or third line therapy and also has had a really positive response to serolimus. Unfortunately, we've given this drug now to about 15 patients, and unfortunately, it hasn't helped all of them. About half of the patients treated have benefited like Katie and Joey, but half have not. These are pictures of Lisa and Sergio, two Castleman's patients that failed first line, second line, third line therapy, and also did not respond to serolimus, and they passed away. Patients like Sergio and Lisa remind us of the hard work ahead of us. We should be proud of what we've done, but we need to make the most of every single dollar that we have for Castleman's research. And we've tried our best to do that. So on the screen, you can see where we were in 2012, and then I'm going to superimpose um, where we are today. So seven years later, we now have invested about $1 million into translational research for Castleman disease. And that $1 million has resulted in an additional $7 million in external funding. So a total of $8 million invested into idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease research into 18 different studies. Um, my lab received the first ever NIH grant last year to study IMCD. We now have this unified collaborative network approach that's driving forward our science. We've published four large-scale clinical pathological studies that served as the evidence base for the first ever diagnostic criteria that now exists. We have a registry, a biobank. We're working on developing an animal model. We published the first ever predictive biomarkers of response to therapy just last year. And we now finally have treatment guidelines that can guide clinicians on how to treat Castleman's patients. Many questions still remain for Castleman's, but we've been able to make exciting progress. There's now one FDA-approved drug. That drug, siltuximab, is approved, and it helps about one-third of patients. 
And there's one drug in development beyond interleukin-6, and that's the drug serolimus that I'm on. And we've just launched a clinical trial um, and, and enrolled our first patient just a few weeks ago. So this is a picture of a few of our Castleman's patients. I mentioned there are about 5,000 patients diagnosed each year in the U.S. And based on our work, we're now able to help about one-third to one-half of Castleman disease patients. So many of these patients are benefiting thanks to the work that we've done, but many patients are not benefiting. So we have a lot of work that we still need to do for Castleman disease. But as I think about our work, I also think beyond Castleman disease. And so th this image is to represent that depending on your, your ontology, there are somewhere around 10,000 human diseases. And of those 10,000 human diseases, there are about 1,500 FDA-approved drugs that are approved for about 2,500 of those diseases. So we have basically one quarter of diseases that are covered. Out of the 7,500 diseases that aren't, nearly all of them are rare diseases. 95% of the 7,000 rare diseases that affect 30 million Americans do not have a single FDA-approved therapy. So what I'd like to think about from my journey and my experience taking a drug, serolimus, that was developed for kidney transplantation 25 years ago and applying it to Castleman disease, is to ask the question, how many of those 1,500 drugs that are already approved for one thing may actually be treatments or cures for the 7,000 plus diseases that don't currently have any? And I'm inspired by this cartoon of an old dog reading a book about new tricks. You know, how many of these old drugs that exist could we think about repurposing for new uses? As Daniel mentioned earlier, I wrote a book that came out about a month ago called Chasing My Cure, describing my journey from a medical student uh, to fighting back against my disease. And I wrote this book because I learned so much about life and about living from nearly dying five times and fighting back. Lessons I wish I didn't have to go through all the things I went through to learn, but lessons I want to share with the world so you guys don't have to go through the same things that I did. And I want to highlight a few of those lessons today. The first is that I can literally hear the clock ticking in my overtime, but I've learned that the truth is we're all in overtime and all of us need to make the most of every second. The second is that we have to question the status quo. If we'd continue to follow along of treating me with chemotherapy after chemotherapy, I would have continued to have relapse after relapse and I would most certainly not be alive today. Third is for the gentleman in the room. I hope that you're never confused as a pregnant woman but if you are, I hope you can find some humor in that and in all of life's challenges. And for the women, I hope you're never confused as your father's pregnant wife. But if you are, I hope you can also find humor in that and all of life's challenges. Fourth, you, we need to reflect on what we hope for and what we pray for and then turn those hopes and prayers into action. What can we do to get us closer to that which we're praying for? Fifth, sometimes solutions can be hiding in plain sight. The drug I'm on, serolimus, had been in my neighborhood pharmacy, CVS, that I'd walked past hundreds of times in the three and a half years where I was in and out of the hospital. But no one had thought to try serolimus for me. How many other drugs and solutions are hiding right in front of us in plain sight? And lastly, it takes an army. If this was me working on my own, I would have made about one one thousandth of a percent of the progress that we've been able to make thanks to this incredible team of people from all aspects of the healthcare industry all working together. So I encourage all of you and I hope you guys will all become part of our army, will be a part of this army fighting Castleman disease. Whether it's getting involved by supporting our research uh, uh, li linked on the screen, or it's by sharing ideas about a new study or something that we can do for Castleman disease. Or if it's about spreading the word about Chasing My Cure, this book that I hope will continue to spread the word about Castleman disease and help to make it so that Castleman disease is something that's more quickly diagnosed and more effectively treated. So I want to and by thanking you guys all so much for being a part of this army. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. That means so much to me. Well, thank you, David, for what you're doing. Also, as reflected there, almost 
most diseases are actually rare diseases. That's right. And I don't know if you could give like a real short scintillation of, of what can industry and everyone in the exponential medicine community here and online do to accelerate cures for rare diseases and others that you've learned? I think we need to take advantage of all of the brand new technology, single cell RNA sequencing, serum proteomics, all these great technologies to think about and better understand biology so that we can start to understand are any of these old drugs that are in our rear view mirror, or may, they may be solutions um, for these new diseases or these new problems. And finally, uh, you're wearing a little pin. This is yes. uh, the Castleman, and uh, we need to do the selfie, right? That's right. Okay. So, um, so this, this is Castleman disease is what I have. And so we, we sometimes use the idea of a, uh, that we're all castle men, um, castle men and castle women. And, uh, and we do what's called the Castleman flex. So if I could ask you guys to stand up again and we do this flex. So it's like a Castleman flex, um, but it's also in your face too. It's like, Ugh. And so I'm going to ask that you guys all do it. I'm going to take a picture of this. I think might be the world's largest <laughs> Castleman Warrior Flex ever. Um, and so, X-Men exclusive. Yes, <laughs> X-Men exclusive, exactly. All right, so it's, it's again, it's in your face. Oh. All right, one, two, three. Uh. Oh. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Sammy.